So we have just heard the Gospel of John in full detail. I'm going to go ahead and begin the first talk now, and immediately after it's over, we're going to head on over to the Spirit and Center for lunch. In the prologue of the Gospel of John, we have the announcement of the great mission of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 17, we have a passage which is going to be the cornerstone of this particular talk. Because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church was established by Jesus Christ to promulgate this mission of grace and truth. These are the two cornerstones upon which the church rests. In the story of the woman caught in adultery, we have the opportunity to meditate first on the theme of grace. So let's review that. In chapter 8, starting at verse 2, he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. So he's in the temple area, right there at this point, and that's very, very significant. It's significant because in light of what we just saw in verse 17, John is setting up a contrast between the law of Moses and the grace and the truth brought by Jesus Christ. The temple, the purpose of the temple, the reason for its existence was to be a location in which the commandments of the Decalogue were to be stored. The two tablets that Moses brought down from the mountain were placed in the Ark of the Covenant and stored in the temple that was originally built by Solomon. So Jesus, preaching in the temple, especially with what we're about to see, is establishing his own authority to authoritatively interpret that law of Moses in light of his mission to bring grace and truth. These tablets that Moses brought down from the mountain if you look at Ex- you don't have to look at it right now, but in Exodus 31:18, they're described as inscribed by the very finger of God. That's the phrase that's used in Exodus to describe how those commandments were put together. And it is no accident then, looking ahead in this passage, let's read a little bit. They said to him, "Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Recall in the section prior to this, there was a lot of disputation over the fact that Jesus knew that they were already trying to kill him. And they're trying to find a pretext in the law in order to do that. And now here's the kicker. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. So Jesus, by writing on the ground with his finger, is showing that he has the same authority to interpret the Mosaic Law as God himself who inscribed the tablets right there. The way that John composes this scene is astonishing. The temple setting, the direct quotation from the law of Moses, and the action of Jesus in establishing his authority in this moment. Let's read the rest of the story. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. 
Then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. So it's very important to understand that in this passage, Jesus is not making any excuses for the woman, and he is not in any way minimizing the severity or the gravity of her sin. What he is doing, however, is saying sin is severe, but in this moment, he comes to rescue her from the consequences of her sin. And then he entreats her, do not sin anymore. So there's nothing about this that minimizes the severity of sin. Rather, there's the emphasis on the fact that whatever our sins are, Jesus came to set us free from them. And he illustrates this profoundly with his appearance in the life of this particular woman. Still, the question remains, uh, what about the rest of us? You know, we go, we live our lives, we have our own sins. We can see a passage like this and pray, Jesus, can you come in and free me from my own sins? And what John emphasizes in the resurrection appearance to the disciples is that he came precisely to do that and to provide a way to do that. So if we look at chapter 20, verses 21 through 23, this is where Jesus has just appeared to the apostles. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. What a powerful sentence that is. As the Father sent me, so I send you. So Jesus is saying right there in that moment, the Father sent me to earth with a specific mission. The time has come for me to ascend, and the mission is now yours. Let's see what he says next. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Another very powerful passage, and there are some subtleties here that are best appreciated in the original Greek. Specifically, the Greek word panuma means both breath and spirit. So in the original Greek for this passage, when it says he breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit, the breathed and spirit are the same word. So picture the moment as Jesus exhales onto the apostles. The Holy Spirit is in that moment coming forth from him and overwhelming them and coming upon them. And in fact, taking total possession of them. The only other place in scripture where God breathes on anybody is in Genesis 2-7, where God gathers up dust from the earth and breathes on it. Just like that, the first human being is created. And so in this moment, Jesus is making a new creation of the apostles. They have been recreated by the Holy Spirit in that moment, with the purpose being that whose sins they forgive are forgiven them. That is why he has recreated them. Now, the sacrament of holy orders, following the catechism of the Catholic Church, is directly tied to this passage. This passage is, in fact, what the church teaches is the moment where Jesus instituted the sacrament of holy orders. So from the catechism, we have holy orders as the sacrament through which the mission entrusted by Christ to his apostles continues to be exercised in the church until the end of time. And in the ordination rite, it actually calls right back to this verse. And the purpose we see right here, the purpose of holy orders at its institution is the forgiveness of sins. This helps us contextualize 
several aspects of the sacrament of confession as well, which is being instituted in this same moment in the Gospel of John. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. The priest must hear the sins he is to forgive and exercise judgment in forgiving them. So so what does that mean? Jesus is ready to forgive any sin. But we have to want to be forgiven. We have to truly wish to, as he instructed the woman in adultery, go and sin no more. So if we think about the structure of the sacrament of confession, it precisely illustrates this. So we go into the confessional. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been such and such period of time since my last confession. Here are my sins. And so then I say aloud my sins. The priest, upon hearing the sins, is now able to uh, forgive them. But first, he asks me to say an act of contrition. What's the purpose of saying the act of contrition? The purpose of saying the act of contrition is to follow the command that Jesus gave the woman caught in adultery to go and sin no more. When I say the act of contrition, I am saying, Lord, I wish to sin no more. That's what the act of contrition means. And at that moment, when I have said that act of contrition, the priest then grants me that absolution right there. He forgives those sins right there at that moment. All of that said, you know, so far, you know, this sounds pretty good. Jesus gave us uh, his power to forgive sins to the apostles. Uh, Ultimately, the apostles handed on that gift to their successors, who are are our uh, priests and our bishops. And to this day, they continue that ministry of the forgiveness of sins. Still, we have to ponder... Why is it that we have to say it out loud? And there are a couple of reasons we might be pondering this. One reason is simply, well, God knows my thoughts. He knows what I'm thinking. He can just, I can just interiorly pray and he can read my mind and forgive my sins. And that's that's true. That, That can happen. God could do that. He's God. But there's got to be a reason he wants us to say them out loud. And so I'm going to review with you all um, one of the more famous passages from John in in chapter 3. So we're going to read 3.16 to 21 in light of this concept. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And when we see the woman in adultery, we can see her as a representative of how God wishes for the world to be saved through Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And now, this next part is very, very important. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. So there it is. Through the sacrament of confession, Jesus gives us the opportunity to be someone who prefers the light to the darkness. Whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The one who hates darkness or or does has works that are evil prefers darkness to light. So the remedy. It's to step into the light. 
to allow any evil deeds we have done to be seen, to be in the light, to not be known only to us interiorly, but to be brought forth from out of us into the light. Now, in the tremendous mercy of the church, only one other person needs to hear any of this stuff. One other person. The church calls us in following the command of Jesus to bring any evil works we have into the light in the presence of one person. A person who is bound not to reveal anything you've brought to him to anyone for any reason. But there is that moment in which, in full contrition, we bring those works of evil into the light, that the light is able to sanitize them, to destroy them, to make it as if, for the sake of our soul, they have never occurred. And that is the beauty of the grace of the confessional. Right there. It is the means by which we pass from darkness into the light. In that way, fulfilling the completeness of what Jesus is telling us in John 3, 16 through 21. So we've examined grace, and we've looked at the theme of grace in the Gospel of John. Next, we're going to look at the theme of truth. We've seen how grace, the promulgation of grace is one important aspect of the ministry of his church. The other is the promulgation of truth. And here, I wish to examine with you all what, on the face of it, might seem the unlikeliest of passages from the Gospel of John. This is John chapter 11, starting at verse 49. Let me read it aloud for you all. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing, nor do you consider that it is better for you that one man should die instead of the people so that the whole nation may not perish. John then adds this fascinating parenthetical note. He did not say this on his own, but since he was high priest for that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not only for the nation, but also to gather into one the dispersed children of God. Whoa. So let's think about this for a moment. John's emphasizing that Caiaphas is the high priest, so that causes us to ponder what is the role of the high priest in the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the high priest was the successor to Aaron, the, the brother of Moses. So the Jewish high priest had had a succession. It was established by Aaron, and that succession was perpetuated over many centuries and continued into this time and at this particular moment in time, the recipient of that high priestly authority was Caiaphas. What John is doing here is emphasizing that as God establishes that his people had an instituted leader under the old covenant, the high priest, in addition to his liturgical role, his role in leading worship, he also had a prophetic role. We also see from this passage that Caiaphas is not a man of holy character. Right? He says this thing, and then they're like, okay, let's kill him. Right? We're not looking at someone who is any kind of moral exemplar. It is because of Caiaphas's office and not his personal character that he is capable of teaching religious truth on direct inspiration from God. So now, let's think about what this means in terms of the structure of the Catholic Church. We can see that Peter is characterized throughout the Gospel of John as the leader of the people of the New Covenant. For instance, if we go to John chapter 20 and look at verse 4, so they're, so they're at the empty tomb. Peter and the disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. 
he bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there. Now, there are a couple of ways you can look at this scene. One way you can look at it is kind of imagining John kind of gently teasing Peter. Like, he's recording, yeah, we ran to the tomb and I got there first. <laughs> but, but here's the kicker, is this is a scene in which he demonstrates the importance of Peter's leadership role. He could have gone in first, but he stops at the entrance and lets Peter go in first. Yeah, this scene is an example of something that John does repeatedly throughout this gospel. And what I think, in my interpretation, leads to part of why he wrote the gospel was that, again, as the last apostle, everybody's looking to him for leadership. And he's trying to point out, you already have all the leadership you need through the successor of Peter. In this passage, he steps aside and defers to Peter because Peter is ultimately the leader that Jesus has designated. And that designation of Peter's leadership, we see in chapter 21, starting at verse 15. When Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Well, let's listen carefully to how he phrases it. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time. Why was he distressed? Because he knew that Jesus was asking three times in compensation for the threefold denial right here. This is an important moment of reconciliation between Peter and Jesus. And Peter is not enjoying the moment of being reminded of that betrayal. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? Not just on the level of you need reconciliation because of your sin, but because he's emphasizing in spite of whatever sin Peter is bringing here, it doesn't matter. He has the commission to feed the sheep. Boom, right there. Peter is entrusted with the mission to feed the sheep, to be their shepherd, to be their pastor, to be the good shepherd. Thinking about chapter 10. There it is. So, what's the nature then of Peter's authority to lead us into truth? So, John's chapters 14 through 17 is known as the Last Supper Discourse. It is an extended period of teaching and prayer that Jesus has with the apostles before his arrest. Chapter 16, starting at verse 8, he says, in speaking of the Holy Spirit, And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. Sin because they do not believe in me. Righteousness because I am going to the Father. Condemnation because the ruler of the world has been condemned. I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. And now here's the kicker for St. Peter. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth... He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. So Jesus, without directly referencing Peter there, is emphasizing how not just for Peter, but for the apostles as a whole, they were going to listen to the Holy Spirit and lead their people into the truth, speaking what the Holy Spirit had spoken to them. I'm going to review briefly then what the Catechism of the Catholic Church has to say about the teaching authority of the Pope so we can see how it's consonant with what we see here. The Catechism, it says, the Roman Pontiff, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys this infallibility in virtue of his office when, as supreme pastor and teacher of all the faithful, who confirms his brethren in the faith, 
he proclaims by a definitive act a doctrine pertaining to faith or morals. So this is a pretty restricted set of conditions. What's really important to emphasize here is this notion of infallibility is not a personal gift. It is a gift to the church by virtue of the office. The Pope, as a person, is not infallible as such. It's his doctrinal definitions pertaining to faith and morals that are infallible. He can lead us into all truth. And when we look at the history of the church and even some contemporary events, there's a lot of comfort to be gained in understanding this. It's sadly not been the case throughout the history of the church that every single pope or every single priest or bishop or whoever was a model of personal holiness. Many of them have been, but not all of them. And when we see that we have leaders that don't live up to the holiness that they're called to in their office, it can be horribly discouraging to us as Catholic Christians. It can be very, very difficult. It can be painful. It can be a severe trial of faith even to see these things and know about these things. And so there's a great comfort in knowing that this prophetic gift that God gives to the church is not about the person or the man. It's about the church and it's about confirming us in our faith. Again, consider both Caius, Caiaphas and Peter both sinned gravely. When we reflect on our role in the church, every single one of us, then it comes back to this. Jesus called for his church to promulgate grace and truth. Every single one of us, each baptized one of us, each confirmed one of us, is called in our state of life to promulgate that grace and truth in whatever direction God is calling us particularly. When we have moments where we're blessed with a hierarchy that is as holy as they're called to be, of course, that provides a way and a means forward that's clear. You know, as those of you who know me know, right, um, you know, my, my, my father's family were uh, refugees you know, from Cuba. And in the 80s, what we got to witness, right, was John Paul II ended communism by praying the rosary. It was like a brief moment where the heavens opened up. This brief moment in history where the heavens opened up. And our leader said, this needs to end. And he prayed for it to end. And it ended with no violence to speak of. It was just gone. You can't overstate how meaningful that is when you grow up in a family of refugees from communists. Right? But the thing is, that call to holiness isn't only for popes, it's not only for priests, it's for every single one of us to think about in light of whatever we're experiencing, what am I personally called to do to promote the grace and truth of Jesus Christ? So to conclude this talk, Jesus established the Catholic Church to carry forward his two gifts to us, grace and truth. His gift of grace is perpetuated by forgiveness of sins through the sacrament of confession. This sacrament, the priesthood was explicitly established to perform. His gift of truth is preserved by the teaching office of the church. The unity of this teaching is guaranteed by the successor of Peter, but all of his disciples partake in this blessing. And that includes you and I, and it's why you're here today. You're here today because you felt called to be equipped to bring forth and profess the truths that Jesus Christ entrusted to his church. But far be it from me to lie between you and lunch. Lunch will be served in the Spirit and Center, um, you know, through the doors over around in the back, and Christie's in the back, and will lead us on over there. See you there.